These days, it helps not just to be an activist, but a scientist. How PETA has turned research labs into a tool for animal rights. Next on The PETA Podcast. Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this behind-the-scenes look at PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. On today's episode, how PETA is bringing animal rights into the research labs. It used to be that activists would stand outside the labs with a protest sign. These days, major medical breakthroughs are being made inside the labs themselves on treatments for diphtheria, a deadly illness to humans. For more than 100 years, the treatments relied on experiments done on horses because the horses have a large blood supply. But recently, PETA scientists backed a research effort to find a way around the horses. It worked, and now it's paved the way for other medicines and antitoxins to work for humans. It's a victory for the animals that only happened because activists were scientists too. Jeffrey Brown is an epidemiologist who is the science advisor for PETA's International Science Consortium. My conversation with Jeff on the diphtheria treatment breakthrough that has the potential of sparing horses from experimentation and helping human beings around the world on the PETA podcast. We always talk to you about science, and that's because a lot of people don't know that that PETA actually, when it comes to activism, PETA is involved in science. PETA has 25 scientists on staff. It's almost as if to be an animal rights activist has to involve science in in a way that it hasn't in previous generations of animal rights. Is Is that a fair statement? You have to involve science and scientists to make the changes that we want to make um, in getting animals out of laboratories. So um, in addition to PETA, I think every, everyone has heard of PETA, but um, not a lot of people have, have an awareness that we have this additional uh, tool in the toolkit and that's the PETA science consortium international. Um, And this is a, out of recognition that in order to do big science, you have to involve scientists in many different countries. So, the Science Consortium has 18 full-time scientists working on these issues. And we're in the U.S., we're in the U.K., we're in Germany. And that means that we're working with researchers and government agencies in all these places uh, because you don't solve animal testing-related problems in just one place. You've got to solve them in many places at once. All right. So let's talk about this specific work done to find an antitoxin or uh, some kind of medicine to treat diphtheria. First of all, who's the scientist and how did he's part of the consortium? How did it come up that, that this is an area that PETA was concerned about? It it goes back quite a long way. Um, In 2015, PETA India conducted um, a series of inspections of these facilities where horses are kept for use in medical scientific related experiments. Um, and you know, what you what those inspections found is about what you would expect. The conditions were terrible. These, these horses, there were about 7,000 horses spread across these nine facilities. Um, and at every single facility, we found horses who were suffering from anemia, um, parasitic infections. They had injuries that hadn't been treated. Some of these places didn't even have trained veterinarians on staff. Um, And so we had to start asking the question, what what are these companies using these horses for? And one of the main products that comes out of these horses, as odd as it sounds to people, is that there are products made from the blood of horses that are turned into medicines for humans. Those medicines are intended to act very quickly like what a human immune system would do. If you have the time for a human immune system to respond to an illness like diphtheria, that takes weeks. What a common treatment is for illnesses like diphtheria is, um, you know, this this used to be a very common childhood illness in the United States and elsewhere. 
it, it's become less of a, an issue here as vaccines have been introduced. But outside the U.S., where people don't normally get vaccinated for this diphtheria, this condition that causes a, a, a sore throat and um, it can cause long lasting problems with your heart and other organs. Um, if you don't get the vaccine, this is still an issue. And to make a treatment for it in facilities like these places in India, you inject horses with um, the toxin that the, the diphtheria bacteria produce and you let their immune system, you let the horse's immune systems react to this. And then after a couple of weeks, you start this repeated process. Every two weeks, you can drain gallons and gallons of these horses' blood and filter out the part of their immune system's reaction to the infection. And then you can put that in a, in a syringe and yeah. inject it into people as a treatment. Well, let me, let me stop you there because, as they say, a lot to unpack. I asked you about why the need and you began with the horses back in 2015. So this is sort of going backwards in a way you saw horses in trouble and they were being used to find this treatment for diphtheria. I think the question is always, why are these animals in the positions we find them in? And in this case, diphtheria, the reason diphtheria is such a focus um, is uh, it, can, it can be pretty technical, but there's a very simple way to say it. Diphtheria is um, it's a very simple illness to understand. There's only one toxin that diphtheria-causing bacteria produce. So if you come down with this illness in India or the United States or in anywhere in Europe, you're, you're all going to be um, facing a need to treat the same toxin. So this is sort of like a low-hanging fruit. Yeah. What we knew also, because of our connections in the scientific world, we knew scientists who were um, experts, not just experts, but people who had invented a process that could replace the use of horses to make these antibody-based drugs. Um, and we started conversations with them. We asked them, if you were, you know, in our position, you see these horses um, suffering in these facilities, where would you start? We, we want to prove to the research community that, that they don't need to use horses to make drugs from horse blood. We want to find the most straightforward place to start. And everyone said diphtheria. Even the World Health Organization said, not only do we need a better supply of, um, of these drugs that are usually made from horses, but we specifically, we don't have enough to treat all the cases of diphtheria in the world. All right. Let me, and, let me stop you there just, just because I, I just want to like get it out from you like a, in a spoonful at a time so we can understand diphtheria. You said it gives you a sore throat. How does it, how do you get it? Do you get it from um, like a, a, a mosquito bite or a, 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 how did, how is it, how, how is it transferred from person to person? Yeah, diphtheria, like a lot of these very common childhood infections, they're passed from person to person. Um, you know, we've we've really become more aware of how much contact we have with other people during the pandemic over the last year. And so this is um, a back, it's caused by a bacteria that is spread from people coughing around one another, sharing um, cups and glasses. So usually when you see people who have this illness, it's very young kids who put everything in their mouth and they're, they're always around one another. We've established what diphtheria is. PETA back in 2015 found these horses that were used to develop this medicine. And you're trying to figure out how can we save these horses? But now when you talk to the scientists and ask them about the need, what were they saying about what kind of antitoxins or medication exists now for diphtheria? What kind of need was there for this, for something new? This is a great question because this is why PETA and the Science Consortium are so crucial in situations like this. Drugs that are used to treat conditions like diphtheria, these antitoxin drugs, they're not what we would call blockbuster drugs, right? So usually drug companies are interested in developing new and modern therapies for um, illnesses or conditions that millions or hundreds of millions of people would suffer from. But diphtheria, like I said, it's not incredibly common. 
these days. So it's difficult for drug companies to uh, to say that they have enough financial interest in, in, in doing the work here. So unfortunately, what that translates to is that these horse blood derived drugs for treating conditions like diphtheria, they've been made in the exact same way for more than 100 years. 100 You're- years. Hold on a second now. More than 100 years. That means we're dealing with uh, what? The the uh, an analogous situation to making butter from a churn, right? I mean, it's, you know, they weren't really taking diphtheria seriously, right? Yes. These, these, this specifically the diphtheria antitoxin made from horse blood was among the very first drugs ever created in, in the modern sense. And it was uh, developed so long ago that, um, the uh, the science behind why it worked as a treatment wasn't even understood. So this is a problem, you know, this continuing to use old technology, like you said, you know, still using a, a hand butter churn, um, it's not good medical science. And this is why I mentioned that um, it's this, of course, we're, we're trying to make sure that horses aren't used in, in procedures like this any longer, but we're not the only voice. So it's good to focus in areas where uh, we see that we can bring other collaborators, other scientists to uh, help solve a problem like this. Because if you're using a, a century old process of making a medication, there's going to be problems with it. And with drugs like the diphtheria treatment that's made from horse blood, it's made from horse blood. I mean, it, Blood products are a little bit scary to work with. They they can bring viruses from one species to another. And again, this is really in the front of everyone's mind right now, because this is how uh, we think the coronavirus spread from non-human species to humans. So um, moving away from using horse blood is a primary uh, goal for the global health community. Well, how about this idea that it's horse blood and if you're dealing with something, because you're looking for a cure, not a cure, let's say you're looking for a medication for humans against diphtheria and the use of horse blood, just from things that we've said in previous conversations, it doesn't sound like horse blood would necessarily be, um, the results from horse blood would be translatable to human blood. Uh, is 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 that the case or are they kind of synonymous in terms of its value? No, you're right. Uh, Using horse blood is a little bit scary in uh, people uh, because your body recognizes it as a foreign object. You know, there's a, there's a medical term for this um, uh, that's called serum sickness. So if you inject blood from another species into a human um, you, you tend to have some degree of an allergic reaction to it. And at the uh, far end of the spectrum, for people who react very poorly to this, um, the, the treatment can end up being more life-threatening than the illness itself. So diphtheria, it, it doesn't commonly kill people unless they're very young or, or they're ill for other reasons. But serum sickness and a serious allergic reaction to a non-human blood product can and does kill people who go into anaphylactic shock. So we have the situation where the treatment or the uh, the way to get at the antitoxins for diphtheria developed over 100 years ago, still being used today. PETA now senses that, wait a minute, we see animals being used here to, to create this antitoxin. And then you went out to other members of your science consortium. And what did what did they do? What, did, how did they go to work and find a, an answer to this problem of, of using horses for a cure or medication for diphtheria? As is the case quite often in situations like this, uh, the answer is, is usually that you need to get the right people together in the room. So we, we work with, uh, scientists in Germany who, like I said, they are experts in, uh, creating these antitoxin drugs or creating antibodies generally without using animals. Um, and we collaborated with some government agencies in the UK, um, who were actively looking for replacements for 
diphtheria antitoxin made from horses. This really was sort of a, a meeting of the minds where uh, through this recognition that we, we know what the science is. We know there are other drugs on the market that uh, don't use horse blood to make antitoxins. Um, and we knew that we could repeat those successes and, and essentially make a template for how any other organization or company could very um, efficiently and affordably go through the same process of demonstrating that if there is a current product made from horse blood, like the diphtheria antitoxin, here's the process from A to Z of how to replace it with a non-animal version. So, so this was kind of a breakthrough. Uh, first of all, did it, did it, how, how well did it work? How well uh, was, the, uh, was the experiment so that people could, could confidently say, you know, this could be applied not just in the case of diphtheria, but in some other illnesses and diseases? It worked great. You know, one of the um, the sort of proof is in the pudding with projects like this. So when we finished the project, we left with the set of antibodies that outperformed the antitoxin that's made from horse blood, and we published the results in a scientific journal. And so this publishing process means that a group of other scientists uh, in the field reviewed the work, essentially allowed this to be published. So what we have now is a document that's been um, approved by the scientific establishment. And, and this is exactly what you're saying. It's sort of uh, the conclusions from research, like what the science consortium is, has just funded in, in this project is this is an excellent uh, proof of principle that for very little money, as far as drug development is concerned, you can go from start to finish in just a couple of years um, and come out with, with um, a replacement that performs at least as well as, if not better than, drugs made from horse blood. And at the same time, we know that there are other very real reasons that companies want to avoid um, selling these products made from horse blood. And that namely is they last a lot longer. You can make one batch and it can sit on the shelf for years without going bad. So there are a lot of other features like that that come out of this that say, this isn't just an animal ethics issue. This also is just a, a question of taking century old medicine and bringing it into the modern era. So better technology, better, better results in terms of bringing people to wellness, taking them from disease to wellness. Tell me what other kinds of diseases it might be beneficial in, in treating. Well, we've already started um, a second project working with some of the same collaborators to develop a treatment for um, black widow spider bites. Many more people are bitten by black widow spiders every year than uh, people come down with diphtheria. Um, and this was uh, one of many areas where I think this, this kind of project can be successful. There are groups who are doing similar work or are interested in doing similar work for treating um, all sorts of spider and snake bites. So, you know, these, anything that's caused uh, uh, by a venom or um, a toxin um, is, is in line for other projects like this. And at the same time, the, the gr group that we were working with in Germany, um, just at the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic, they stopped everything like most laboratories around the world did and said, what can we do here? How can we help quickly develop treatments for the coronavirus? And this exact same process that was used um, to make this replacement for the diphtheria antitoxin made from horses um, was used to develop a set of antibodies that can treat coronavirus in people. Um, and this is very important because what we've also seen around the world is that uh, companies that already have these horses at these horse facilities, like those companies in India, mm -hmm. they saw the opportunity of the coronavirus as a chance to develop new products made from horse blood. And that's something that is just completely outdated. And uh, so we were happy to see that um, there's been a lot of attention paid to um, how fast companies can respond to emerging illnesses by 
using this non-horse approach. So people saw the research or they got the buzz in the medical and the research community. They saw that these antitoxins can be, can be developed without horses. So did it stop the use of horses entirely? No, this is a, a much more systemic problem. Stopping all horse use is going to take some time. Um, it's built into the system that these companies have used for so long that what we do have at the moment is a court case in India where we've asked the Indian government to recognize that based on the results that we've had with this project uh, that showed very clearly that companies who are currently selling products like the diphtheria antitoxin using horse blood uh, they can make an improved product that's safer for people who receive the drug by moving away from using animals. So in order to motivate companies to move away from using horses, um, we're actively seeking um, instruction from government agencies and, and in this case, the Court of India um, as a place for us to take this scientific argument, which says, you know, companies basically have no excuse any longer for continuing to use horses. And that's where the next steps are, are heading in this process. So Jeff, is India the, the biggest country where this is being done or is it, how how is it being done elsewhere in the world or is India the biggest perpetrator? It's difficult to say for sure, but yes, India is among the, uh, the countries where more horses are used to make these drugs. These drugs used to be made everywhere, including in the United States and in Western Europe. But as animal protection laws got stronger in the U.S. and in Europe, companies that make these drugs um, across the board stopped producing those uh, drugs in horses where oversight of the welfare of those horses was taken into account by government agencies. And they moved them to countries where that kind of oversight doesn't exist or isn't quite as strong. So a lot of these things are done because of economics. Uh, people would change on a dime if they could make more money, save more money. Uh, is that the case with the use of non-horse methods uh, in in these drugs that for or the these antitoxins for diphtheria and perhaps other diseases? Is it more cost effective? Yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, we could talk about the numbers, but uh, the the I think the important thing to recognize is that uh, the PETA Science Consortium International, which funded the development of this diphtheria antitoxin, um, we're not a big drug company. We don't have the budget of a big drug company, but we were able to fund a project that in just a couple of years showed very quickly and, and, and efficiently that uh, we could make um, a, a replacement for these horse drugs. So the writing is on the wall. If the science consortium can do it, any drug company can do it, um, you know, 10 times over with the kind of budgets that are available to companies. So it's in part an economic consideration, but it's also more basically change is hard. Even if it's good change and the right change, companies don't like um, moving from one way of doing business to another without being told that they need to do so or have to do so. And that's what we're doing. We're very loudly telling companies um, through, you know, research like what we've just funded, that uh, we can do it better than they can. Is the PETA International Science Consortium, is it like uh, the tech world where something is open source and people can 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 use some of the, the methods or they could, like you said, there's a this blueprint. I mean, it's it's easy enough for a drug company to to take from the research and go off on its own, right? Absolutely. And that's part of the way we structure these projects. We want the final product to be usable by everyone. Um, and we, we say that from the first day of working on projects that our goal is to, to show everyone in these publications how to do this from start to finish. So there is no licensing fee or, you know, um, it, we don't keep this information secret. We, we want to tell everybody um, how to do this and how to repeat these successes. So we put out the story uh, near and far in, in the press. Um, we present at conferences. We, we host workshops to make sure that the people who know how to do the really technical pieces of this are, um, are able to, to likewise sort of 
shout is to anyone who will listen about um, what this approach is, because it's very straightforward. Yeah. And one of the things that you mentioned, and I, I wanted to save it for now, you mentioned the coronavirus and everyone is very like the public, the research community, I guess this and the drug companies, right? This is where they perceive the money is going to be in the race to the vaccine. Uh, you said some people who are working on this on, on horse blood, they stopped and that they had created some, some, was it a vaccine or an antitoxin to be used for, uh, how was it used in the coronavirus fight? Right. So, um, the, the, the difference between a vaccine and an antitoxin is that a vaccine um, is um, used to make your immune system produce its own antibodies that then right. eliminate some condition. Uh, an antitoxin is that you take the antibodies that have already been made against something um, and, and you extract that. So it's almost like a shortcut to having an immune reaction. And that's why in the past, animals like horses were used because you can expose them to this condition, make their body have an immune reaction, and then take their antibodies to, you know, diphtheria or what have you and purify them. So then you've got that to just give to someone. And what, what the group that we funded to develop this diphtheria treatment, um, they were the ones who, who very quickly said, what we can do right now is we can develop antibodies that uh, neutralize the coronavirus. Um, so they went through the exact same process um, as they went through to create this uh, antitoxin to treat diphtheria. In, instead of using the diphtheria bacterial toxin, they used uh, the coronavirus. So what they have is a treatment for uh, a potential treatment for people who've been infected with the coronavirus rather than a vaccine. And they skipped the horses altogether. Skip the horses altogether. And does it work? I mean, has it been used on people? Is it, been, is it something that still has to go go to trial? Or is, is this uh, the results that you cited just from experiments recently? Yeah, those were, like everyone who's developing new treatments, these were just the initial uh, results. It's very easy to show that um, you've created a, an antibody that does something or doesn't do something. Um, what the, the strength of their results in these early experiments were sufficient to get uh, the interest of um, a consortium of other industry partners in Germany and in a big name drug company. So, yeah, I mean, this is um, one of many um, new treatments that's been put into the pipeline because just in the last year, we've seen more than 200 vaccines in development and several hundred treatments for uh, coronavirus that are moved into development. It's a bit of an unprecedented moment with how much focus and resources have gone into this process. Yeah, but it makes sense because, you know, as we talk about the coronavirus versus, say, diphtheria, um, diphtheria, maybe 5,000 cases last year I, I saw in one report. Uh, coronavirus, right. uh, 25 million in uh, the United States alone. So. It's, it's it's important, I think, to recognize that by moving away from using horses and making treatments like this, you really compress the amount of time that's needed to develop a new drug. So, so as the, the, the drugs that are developed from horses, those take years to get to the market. But if you can use these processes that cut out horses, it just takes a few weeks yeah. to get to the same place. So an, another shortcut because of more, uh, more modern science and science that does not involve animals, in this case, horses, uh, you know, are we going to see some of these, you say these are antitoxins, which are different from vaccines because it is providing the antibodies to a patient, right? To fight off the disease. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. And then, so are we seeing it used more experimentally? Are, are they, are they going to come to market a lot sooner, or are they, as you say, they're in the pipeline. How long will it take before we actually see even more success from what PETA and the International Science Consortium has done? The great news here is that um, this is a recognized um, 
uh, this, this approach to making antitoxins without using horses is recognized in the field. There are already drugs on the market that are made this way instead of being made through horses. And even before the coronavirus pandemic, there were hundreds of, of drug candidates made without using animals that were, you know, as they say, in the pipeline. Um, it's hard to say exactly how long it takes for any specific drug to get to the market. It does usually take at least a couple of years. But the I think the the important thing to recognize is that there, there are already, you know, let's say between 10 and 15 drugs on the market that are made without using horses in this way. And so we went from having a few new drugs uh, in the pipeline every year to having several hundred. Uh, it's, it's a trend that's recognized worldwide. So companies are already using this approach to make those big blockbuster drugs where, where the science consortium will continue to be involved are all these places where, like you say, with, with conditions like diphtheria, where if there are only 5,000 cases per year and there's already a drug on the market that's made from horse blood, it's the science consortium's goal to focus on all those places where these neglected uh, treatments need to be given the attention to move them along so we can get all these horses off of these facilities. You know, it's when people have, a, I think, would have a hard time imagining why horses are, are so valuable in some researchers mind in the development of drugs. And I guess it has to do with the fact that they've got more blood than any other animal, than a, a rat or a dog or any other kind of animal they could experiment on. Right. Is that, that, that would be a logical way of thinking. Is that correct? That's the truth. That is the only reason why we're talking about horses. That's the only reason why horses are the preferred animal. If you're making a product from their blood, then you go for the animal that has the largest amount of blood and um, horses that are, who are used in this way are used for their entire lives. Um, They go through this process of being bled every two weeks or every month for years. Um, And they, they are literally used as blood factories. And because of what the International Science Consortium of PETA, PETA has done, now many fewer horses are being used as blood factories, right? Yeah, that's right. And our goal is to make sure that every one of these facilities um, is closed down. Um, we're trying to do that through every possible approach. Uh, we've got the scientific approach nailed down, and now we're working more closely with governments and courts and the companies themselves to see what it's going to take to uh, keep the companies moving along in the right direction. And the good news to report here is that uh, these companies are well aware that the clock is ticking. And we've even had one company say to us, they expect that at some point, the process of using horses in these experiments will, will likely be banned by a government. So they understand that this is a, um, a historical relic and some companies are more interested in, in joining the present than others. And that's where we focus our efforts. You know, you, you strike where the iron is hot and set the example for all other companies to rise to. Um, and that all starts from very straightforward projects like what the Science Consortium has funded with this diphtheria project. And, and then going back to the initial question about modern day animal rights activism, This is one where it's not a matter of holding up a picket sign and saying, stop using animals. It's a matter of actually putting on the white coat and going into the lab and really working side by side with the scientists in a way to get to an answer that is non-animal, non-exploitative, and that helps people. You're exactly right. And and don't, you know, have no illusions. We still need people who are willing to stand up and and demonstrate and raise awareness in public to say, uh, you know, in in cases like this, if we know that this can be done without horses, why isn't this the new standard? Why is, why are governments um, allowing companies to keep using these horse based methods? But by putting that lab coat on and doing the work, we have a much stronger case to make and a really strong backing for, for people to know that we're not just hoping for this to happen. We're showing people how it's happened and how we're bringing it forward. Um, And every step of the way, I think the more evidence that we bring from this scientific point of view, 
um, that helps us convince more people in the scientific establishment and at these government agencies. So we know that over time, they're more receptive to these messages about don't just make this, uh, you know, a, a one-time thing where one successful project takes horses out of the equation. How about the next step is to take all the horses out of the equation? Why don't we get some policies that make it easier for companies to transition away from using horses in, in experiments like this? Well, Jeff, I want to congratulate the, you and the consortium for the work you've done because this is really a major breakthrough in terms of the use of animals in research. Or am I am I am I making making too big a deal of it? No, this is this is uh, very landmark work, and I want to pass that thanks on to everyone who's supported the science consortium over the years because the the funding that goes into projects like this comes from everyone who's who sends in five dollars or twenty dollars. Um, this is a group effort, you know uh, the 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 family of supporters of, of PETA and the science consortium is what makes this work possible. So thank you all for, for this work. And, um, and I hope everyone uh, takes pride in knowing that we didn't stop at one project. We're continuing this work and we will continue it uh, for as long as we possibly can. Jeffrey Brown is an epidemiologist who is the science advisor for PETA's International Science Consortium. Talk to me about how PETA-funded diphtheria research created a breakthrough that will spare hundreds of animals' lives and provide modern, workable antitoxins to fight human disease. And that's our show this time out. Thank you for listening to our program. Contact us at PETA.org. You can get more information on that medical breakthrough there as well on PETA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amok. That's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K or on AMOK.com. Or see my work at the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. That's ALDEF, A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on your favorite podcast app or on Apple Podcasts, where you can rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo.